Hello, hello, and welcome back to BTS Squared, where we go behind the scenes at Bantech Systems, and welcome to the second episode of the Stepford County Railway version 1.6 technical mini-series. This video is all about the rewrite of the signalling system and its new sensors, so let's go. Hello and welcome to the second episode of this Stepford County Railway version 1.6 mini-series. So unlike the last one which was extremely technical and was pretty much just programming the entire time um, and very much about the streaming system, this episode now looks at the complete rewrite of the signalling system, so of course there'll still be a bit of programming here and there, um, but a lot more visually to show you in studio. Um, and we will compare sort of the current version, the new version, to the old version pre 1.6 and have a look at some of the benefits. So straight off the bat, if you have ever seen um, Studio with one of the older versions, you'll see that there were all sorts of sensors down the middle of the tracks, um, just like this. Um, whereas on the new version, as you can see now, there are no uh, sort of bricks that run along the tracks. Um, there are just these little coloured blocks all around the place. Um, now these coloured blocks, some of them did exist in the old version. So for example these yellow blocks are the AWS stoppers and um, there are some grey blocks somewhere that will be the AWS ramps. Um, there's a couple of them. And so you might have seen those before, however they weren't um, in this kind of form factor. They were very much in their kind of cosmetic visual setup. Um, and the, the difference really is just that I can see these a lot easier in studio. Um, and so can other members of the team. So we can uh, just really, really easily see where those are. They do get resolved to the nice cosmetic ones um, by the server at runtime. Um, so it's not too much of an issue. Um, same for some of the other sensors actually which then um, disappear completely when you actually play the game. And so an example of that is this point sensor here um, which controls the junction up ahead. So one of the massive benefits to using sensors like this um, compared to the old ones is that if we wanted to change a bit of track for example, um, so let me zoom out a little bit. So we've got for example this, this nice curved pe uh, bit that peels off from the junction. Um, now before, we would have blocks that would run all the way along there with the, um, with the bricks and if we wanted to move this at all, um, we'd have to ununion this curvy sensor, move all the parts appropriately and extend bits, change the size of bits, whatever, to fit the new section of track and then union it again and then set up all of the signals again to look at this new sensor because any object values that were pointing at the union uh, would have broken in that process. Um, this new one much much easier so if we did want to move the tracks at all all it would be a case of is uh, simply just moving the sensor just like that put it in the new location and everything's set up and, and ready to go with the with the new block entry just a few studs back. So a lot easier um, a lot easier in many many different ways. Now another benefit of using these kind of sensors is that our train movement system um, doesn't rely on Roblox physics, it uh, sort of uses C-frames and some body movers um, to move the train around. And that means that we can basically just get rid of all collisions to do with the trains, we can set them in a completely different collision group to the scenery and the tracks to make sure that there's no interaction. Um, try and reduce the amount of physics calculations that the engine is doing in terms of uh, comparing whether the train has collided with something or not. Um, and that means we can then re resort back to uh, ray casting, which is what we use to work out where the trains need to go in the first place. Um, and we can simply ray cast forwards and behind us and have a look for these kind of sensors on the track and simply handle them as we come across them from a ray casting rather than relying on collisions, which is what the old sensors did. So this requires a kind of a different approach to signalling and you'd probably argue a more realistic approach um, when you're comparing to real life. And that is to treat them as blocks. Um, and what I mean by blocks is not parts like in Roblox, but 
uh, specific sections of track that are kind of under that signal's control. And when trains are inside of that block, you don't want any other trains to enter that block. Um, now our definition of a block is slightly tweaked from real life in Stepford County. There are some situations where you can have multiple trains technically in the block of a signal, um, which we'll probably discuss in a little bit. Um, but essentially you'll have entry points like this uh, AWS stopper that record trains going into the block and likewise we'll have exit points where the train then leaves that block. Um, now to help me set all of these up because it's not just now a single sensor and also to save me having to go in and uh, edit the values in the explorer on the right hand side which you can see that they're all inside of this this folder the signal data folder but I don't want to be messing around with those. Um, we've been messing around with those for ages and having to sort of manually set these object values. It's not very much fun. It can be quite easy to accidentally miss things. So now I've created this plugin that you can see on the left. And so when I select a signal, it, it gives me these options. Um, and I can click modify signal and it sort of tells me all about that signal. It tells me um, what AWS ramps we have, what stopper we have, it tells me these green ones refer to different ways to enter the block um, other than just the default stopper. Um, we've got advanced signals and uh, previous signals as well. And in the actual workspace, we can see these visually. So the color that surrounds each block, you can see some of the ones up there as well, matches the color that is used for its symbol here. So this red is this AWS stopper here. And essentially, if this signal is at a danger and you try and pass, this is what stops you. Um, the other stoppers you can see have green on them and that's because if we jump over to one of them that's where we exit the block. So we're going into the next block here so we want to exit that previous block and the same up here with this signal. So that's why that's set up like that and then it's got these advanced signals um, as well so there's one of them C60A uh, and just C60 as well as the other one if we have a look. Yeah we just selected that one. Um, the previous signals, it's quite useful to have those on there as well, just to let you know. Um, they don't actually get saved as part of this signal. Um, that's actually looking through and seeing which signals have their advance set as the one that you've currently selected. Um, but it's, it's useful to know that I've correctly set up the two signals that merge into this one track. I've correctly set those up to have this one as their advance signal. So it's, it's useful for checking and it's useful for setting stuff up as well. It's also really easy for me to make the signal controllable or not from the um, signal control center um, and change a few other bits and pieces about that. So that's how the plugin sort of works on a very basic level. I can add things to it. So I can click this. Um, I can select, for example, this stopper and it will add that as an entry point. Um, I can also click any entry points and turn them into exit points quite easily, um, which is quite nice. So that's an exit point, sorry exit for a green, I can turn that into an entry point if I want to. Right, so let's have a look at one that's a bit more complicated to show you kind of how some of those would work. So actually let's pick this one that's right here. So let's cancel that. Let's select this one, C059, modify that. Now here we've got a few more things. And in this particular case, we've got these two AWS stoppers for these shunt signals also act as entry points uh, into this signal block. And the reason why is because uh, if we zoom out a little bit, you can see that they will use that same bit of track. And if we pass one of those, we don't want to be allowed to pass this one as well. So they're entry points. There is also another entry point all the way over here at this signal. Now it's not necessarily immediately obvious why, but if you again apply the same logic of if a train passes this signal here and ends up coming down this track, we don't really want trains to enter these blocks here either and go through because they might cross the path if they're going off to Stepford Victoria and that train's coming across here. So anywhere where the trains might interact and potentially crash with one another, um, you obviously don't want trains in the same block there. Now these ones here, because of their complexity, we want to allow signalers to manually control those. Um, we also probably want them to be cautionary so they can only be yellow, they can't go to green. So just to make sure that drivers are slowing down as they approach them. Um, and rollback enabled, which you'll know about if you are a signaler, but essentially 
that just rolls it back to its uh, previous setting when a train has passed through and exited the block. So that's kind of the benefits of this new system and the sort of the powerfulness of this plugin. I can even rename the signal up here, which is really easy when I'm placing new ones. We usually just leave them with kind of a default name to start with, and um, once we're happy with the positioning and the setup, we'll then go back and name them all. So that's quite useful, and also the ability to select something and just have it selected in the workspace as well means I can then just hit F and just kind of zoom straight to it, which is always very nice. The arrow on top as well, um, the hinges do the same kind of job as well. They, they show which direction that sensor is in. So if you pass the sensor in the wrong direction, it ignores it. If you're going in the same direction as the sensor, it, uh, it counts that. So that helps us with the certain situations where the track is used in multiple directions and uh, we only want the sensors to fire in an appropriate direction. So something else this plugin does which is really cool, you might be wondering what the cleanup signal and cleanup everything does. Um, this system actually automatically determines whether a, a signal should have four aspects or not. Um, in situations where there's no possibility of having double yellows, um, it will go to a three aspect signal. So for example here, the signals ahead could be yellow, so this could be a double yellow. So that's fine, that's a four aspect signal. However, if we jump forward to this one, which then has the terminating platforms ahead, this can only ever be cautionary, it can't go to a double yellow and it can't go to a green. Um, and that's because there are two platforms ahead, this stays at an amber, um, and even if it could go green, there's no signal ahead that could possibly show an amber for this to show a, a double amber. So I'll show you an example of how we can turn a four aspect to a three aspect signal, uh, simply by changing its properties. So if we jump over to this one, which is a four aspect signal, if I, for example, made this one cautionary, so it could never go to a double yellow, it will always show a caution aspect at the absolute least. Um, if I now updated that, you can see it's just changed straight away to be a three aspect signal. There's a 45 here that will show up when it's uh, got an amber going, but there's only three aspects that that could now possibly show. Um, and again, if I just undo that, change it back, and uh, there we go, four aspect signal. So that's also really, really useful. I used to have to run a command to do those, so that's sorted. Um, you might also be wondering how I get rid of some of these if I wanted to get rid of them. So for example, this advanced signal, if I didn't want that one, if I've maybe selected the wrong one or I'm moving the signal elsewhere, I click it once, it selects it and highlights it in red. But if I click again on the same one, that's it, it's removed. And now I can update that signal and it no longer has an advanced signal ahead of it. It has actually turned to a three aspect signal in the process because if there's no signal ahead, um, it can't possibly show a double yellow. A double yellow implies that there's a yellow ahead. That can't happen if you've not got any signal ahead of you. So again, I can then go in and uh, add that one back by clicking anything that's within that signal. Um, attach that one, update, and there we are. We're back to a four aspect signal again. So that's very, very useful. The uh, last feature that I'd like to show you on this plugin that I've made um, is all of these buttons down here that are grey. And obviously with all these extra signals around, um, particularly some of the ones that do extra entry and exit points. Um, so I'll show you what one of those looks like in a moment. Um, we've passed a few, but I think the easiest way to explain them is up here. Um, so you can see this one that we've highlighted in green. Now that's an exit point as well as the further two signals. So there's a signal here, a signal here. When you pass both of those, you're now out of the block. But there is one other situation where we want trains to leave the block, and that's if they've entered here, coming across the track. Once they're clear of that crossing, there's no need for them to be in that block anymore, and they obviously need to exit the block because they've entered it. So they enter here, but they actually exit here with this green block. And so when the back end of that train crosses over that green block, we go, yep, yeah, this, this junction's clear. You guys over here can now actually enter this block and drive forwards. So to do that, I've obviously had to place this extra signal that isn't necessarily an AWS stopper or, or a ramp or anything like that. It's just a standalone sensor that just exists there. I've called it exit gate. So to create those and to create some of the other bits, um, create new signals and things like that, I've got all these buttons. So if I click new entry gate, you can see it's created me a new blue one here. 
new exit gate has created me a green one, a new ground signal has created me a signal that has a pole so that it can sit on the ground, um, a new floating signal will be one that for example sits on a gantry, and a new shunt signal will be one of those depot signals. And that just makes it really easy then, because it's inserted, it's in the right folder, it's put it in the signals folder, I can then just drag that to wherever I want it, pop the signals on the track, and it's pretty much good to go at that point. I just need to now set it up with uh, some advanced signals and things like that, perhaps add a name to it. Again, like I said, I can change it from this default name to be whatever I want it to be, um, and that's it. That's it sorted. Um, it does pop up some warnings if there's certain things, so for example there's no exit to that block, so you'll enter it and you'll never exit, things like that just in case I forget. Um, but this just makes it so, so much easier. So now that I've shown you that plugin, um, let's have a look how it actually works in terms of the code. Okay, so we have this signal control script, and this um, is, what is it, about 1041 lines. This just runs the, the signaling system on the server. So this sort of handles the automated signals. Um, it takes requests for manual signal changes from a signaler, and it puts those in place if they are appropriate. So with all my scripts, I always put the services at the top um, and potentially any modules that I want to call as well. Um, some constants that won't change at all, I'll put at the top as well. Um, depends on your definition of constant, I suppose. These are all referring to um, actual instances. Um, then we've got some constants as well that are just, just plain literals and uh, some user data values. Then I've got my variables, just some uh, tables that will hold some information later, um, and then all of my functions. So I won't go through absolutely every function, I don't think there's a need. A lot of them are quite similar to what they were before, but there's a few key ones that I do want to cover. So I'll just show you this first of all. This one updates the state of a signal. Um, you give it a signal and it essentially calculates what the state should be, uh, taking into account any manual requests for what the signal state should be, as well as any um, sort of trains in the block and things like that that overwrite any kind of manual request. So if there's a train in the block, it's a danger. And that's that's it. You can't overwrite that as a signaler. Um, and so it checks that first. It checks if the block's clear, and if it's not clear, it's a danger, and that's it. End of processing. Uh, same for the platform. If it's attached to a bunch of platforms, so for example, um, let's look at this one at, at Beachley. This signal here, c 60 a that one only refers to these two platforms and if both of these platforms are full we don't want any more trains to come through that signal because they've got nowhere to go so if all of the platforms are occupied then again it's a danger you can't overwrite it that's it then we enter sort of the the softer approach so if it's in automatic mode and the state is either currently in a precautionary mode so a double yellow or in a proceed mode, a green, we then want to look at whether those uh, perhaps need to change. So we look at the advanced signals, so whatever signals ahead of it, if there are signals ahead of it, and if there are, and uh, one of those signals is, for example, at a danger, then this signal should be at a caution. It definitely shouldn't be green or a, sort of a double yellow in that particular situation. So that sets it at a caution. Again, you can't overwrite that. If the one ahead is in danger and you're trying to ask it to be in a double yellow or a, or a green state, or it's just in full automatic mode, it will have to return a caution. It, it can't go any uh, lighter than that. It can't go to, to green or to, to double yellow. Um, if the manual signal has picked danger, then it will be a danger because it only does this bit of logic if it's in automatic mode or if they've selected double yellow or, or a green. Um, now, of course, you can't select a double yellow as a signaler, so it's pretty much if they've selected green or if it's in uh, automatic mode. Now, if the one ahead isn't at a danger, but it is showing a caution, so it's showing a single amber, single yellow light, um, then we'll record that as a preliminary caution. Um, and we'll just say it looks like we want to be a double yellow, um, but there's a bit more logic that we potentially need to do that might override that. So then we look at the type of signal that we've got, and if the signal that we've got is not cautionary, um, then it will show a double yellow. And what I mean by cautionary is, is the ones that I showed you earlier, um, where, for example, we want trains to slow down. 
we want people to be cautious at those signals, so this one will never be anything other than yellow or red. It's a cautionary signal, it can't go to green, because that would imply that you could just go through at line speed. Um, we don't want that for this particular one because of how much danger there could potentially be. So if it's a cautionary signal, it kind of skips over this bit of logic. Um, but if it's not cautionary, it can take green or double yellow, and we've identified that it should be a preliminary caution because the one ahead is at a caution, then we'll um, set that to precaution or a double yellow. Now the reason that we don't just do that inside of this loop here is because we might have two signals ahead of us, um, for example where the line splits, and one of them might be red and the other might be yellow, and so you want to take account of the one that is the most dangerous, so the red. Um, so if there was a caution ahead and danger ahead, if you just took that caution and went straight to showing double yellows, you wouldn't be adequately warning the driver of the potential red if they went down the path that had the red. Um, so again, I'll sort of show you that visually. Um, so again, let's say we're talking about this signal here and we're deciding whether it should be um, a double yellow or a, an amber in that case. Um, and we're deciding whether it should be a caution or a precaution. Well, it can split off to go left up here or it can split off to kind of go straight and right up here. Now let's imagine the one up here on the right is going to be an amber, a caution, um, a single yellow and the one off to the left is going to be a danger or a red signal. If we just looked at the one that was here, we'd say, oh, it has to be a double yellow, a precaution, because the one ahead is a caution. But we need to continue running that loop and continue checking all of the other signals that are ahead of us, because then we'd find the red and we'd realize that that needs to be a caution. So that's why the red one is an instant return when we find it, but the yellow one, the precaution, uh, lets the loop carry on running. Now if we've left both of those, so we've not set it at a caution, we've not set it at danger because we uh, don't have anything in the block, and we've also not set it at precaution because none of the signals ahead are caution. So let's say all the signals ahead are either green or we don't have any signals ahead. In that case we then revert to this last bit of logic which then looks at if it's an automatic signal, has no manual control, then simply it will either be a caution if it's a cautionary signal where we force it to be a yellow or it will just revert back to proceed and it will be green. But if it's not automatic, i.e. there is some manual control, we'll look at the last state that the signaler asked the signal to be and um, we'll do a bit of logic to determine whether that's appropriate, whether we want to manually roll back to that or not based on the settings we've set for that specific signal and usually that's dictated by our head of network signaling who decides whether a particular signal should revert back to their last setting or whether it should stay at danger after a train has passed it and left the block. And in that case we'll set the signal state to be whatever we've asked it to be. So that's how we determine kind of what the state of the signal should be through that logic. Um, the actual setting of the signal parts happens in another bit of logic and that, that's not a problem. Um, that's kind of unchanged from the previous version. Um, it just goes through the state, you know, if it's danger it'll show a red, if it's caution it'll show the yellow, if it's a precaution and it's a four aspect signal it'll show the double yellows, if it's a precaution and it's not a four aspect signal it'll just show the green, and if it's proceed it'll show the green. Uh, we also have off indicators and repeaters, um, they're kind of self-explanatory in terms of how they work if you've played the game. Let's have a look at what else we've got here. Um, so let's have a look at how we check that the block is clear, because that's where some of the, the difference between the old system and this new system comes about. So with the old system, we would be looking at the sensor that runs along the track, we look at touching parts, so there is a API member on, on Roblox that is get touching parts. Um, we look at those, we look at if any bits of trains are touching those um, sensors, and if they are then obviously there's something in the block. If there's nothing touching them, we'll assume there's nothing in the block. Um, that worked most of the time. Um, but this new one, obviously we don't want that, we don't want the blocks running along, we don't want to rely on physics, we don't want to rely on touching, we want them to be in separate collision groups. We want to simply say when we've entered a block, exit a block, and if we've not said that we've exited the block, 
um, and the train hasn't despawned, then we'll assume that we're in there. So essentially what this one does is actually just looks at this uh, in block table that we've got inside of the signal data. And basically every time a train enters, I add them to that table. Every time they leave or they despawn, I remove them from that table. And so simply, if that table is zero, so this whole logic doesn't run, then of course the, the block's clear, there's nothing in there. If it is greater than zero, i.e. we've got one or more trains in the block, then we have to do a bit more logic. So in that case, we'll run through each of the trains that are in the block, and we'll have a look. We'll see if they have um, their emergency brake applied. Now, if they don't have their emergency brake applied, then they're just a normal train in the block, so we return false, the block's not clear. If, however, they do have their emergency brake applied, but they don't have any um, emergency trigger, they, they've not said which um, signal has actually triggered that emergency brake, um, then that's an emergency train that needs to clear out of there first. We, we, we're not sure if we can still go through the block if that emergency brake train is in there. So that could be a situation where, for example, we've entered this block and then we've spadded the next signal along. So we're an emergency train that is within this block and we obviously don't want to send any more trains through because we've not actually cleared the block yet. Now there's a third scenario where we have triggered our emergency brake we have also registered which signal triggered that emergency brake and then all we have to do is have a look at whether that trigger is the signal ahead or whether that trigger is actually the signal that we're worrying about in terms of setting its value. Now if that's the signal that we're worrying about, we actually allow the signal to, to revert back to being caution or proceed because that emergency train that's spatted here needs to clear before anything else can really happen. So to allow that to happen, we, we release this signal when it's appropriate to do so um, and allow that train to then carry on through once their emergency brake has cleared. If, however, it's not from that particular signal and say you were from one of these signals next to you in the shunt, shunt signals here, then we wouldn't treat that as being clear because we want this to remain red while that emergency train clears out of the area. So it's quite a bit of sort of not complex logic, but quite a few different conditions that need to be met um, for it to ignore a train that's in the block. Uh, generally, if there's a train in the block, it will return false that it's not clear. Now, this system isn't complete, in my opinion, because we've not yet changed the way that platform occupancy works. So platform occupancy still has the old style signals, uh, sorry, the old style sensors that run along the platform and we check occupancy through that. Now that we intend to change that into a block system again of entrances and exits, um, just not got around to that yet. So platforms still work as they did before. So I won't show you the check platforms function. It basically works how I said before in terms of checking what's currently touching that sensor. Okay, so I've just scrolled down and found some more functions as well. Um, so a lot of these are related to the manual signaling which is undergoing a, a complete overhaul at the moment and some of these functions will soon disappear. Um, but just out of, of curiosity if you just wondered, um, the request control one essentially just checks whether or not um, you can control that particular signal. Um, so that's to do with whether that signal can go into a manual mode or whether it's forced into automatic mode and also whether someone else has already requested control for that signal implying that either you might be exploiting and trying to control a desk that is already under control uh, or some other kind of issue. Reverting control simply sets all of those signals back to auto which then causes a refresh of them to have a look at whether they should be at the state that they're currently in. There's also attempting to set the signal state again relating to the manual setting of signals and that checks a number of things such as the signal exists, that it can actually go to that particular state that you've uh, selected. So for example, the shunt signals can only be danger or proceed. If you selected something other than that, it's rejected. It also checks your permissions and makes sure that you can actually control signals. Um, so that will look at whether you are in the signaler rank, whether you're potentially in a VIP server and just in the role, and whether you're sat at the desk that uh, is supposed to control those signals. Here's the function to enter the signal block. So this, uh, like I mentioned before, basically just adds that train to that table of uh, who's in the block. 
There's a little bit more logic to make sure that the train isn't already in there, but that's essentially all that it does. It also updates um, whether that train is waiting for the next signal or not. This is to do with the manual control. Again, we're, we're redoing that, so there's not much point explaining how that works fully. But if you are a signal or an SCR, you'll know the blue dots. That essentially clears the blue dot if you actually go through that next signal. The next one's to exit the signal block. Basically the same thing as I say, it just removes them from the block if they're currently in there. Um, and then just make sure that the signal updates itself. And then finally, I have this kind of signal loop that runs, and I'm not a big fan of loops running all the time in the background. Um, it generally implies some sort of bad programming practice. Ideally, you want to be using event-based programming, which we use for the majority of this. This loop just helps to catch some of the edge cases where someone who, for example, is extremely laggy and has jumped over one of the, one of the sensors. Now, if that sensor is an entrance sensor into the block, that's a problem and we've not fully fixed that problem yet so you might find in some um, kind of edge cases where someone quite laggy has entered a block and the signal hasn't updated appropriately for them entering the block that's something we're working on at the moment It is essentially where they've skipped over that signal and so they've not told the server that they found that sensor but the other situation is where they've entered a block but skipped over the exit now that arguably is worse because that can hold up the entire network because it will think they're in the block the entire time until they despawn or leave the game. To counteract that, we've essentially got this loop here which goes through all of the signals that it wants to check. Um, so basically all the signals that are on um, and have some trains in their block. And it will go through each of those signals and it will look at whether the train is extremely far away from those sensors. Um, so I think the, the limit currently is, is something like 1500 studs, something like that. Um, much longer than our trains, in fact that's about three times the length of a train. If you are that far away from all of the entrance and exit sensors, then that suggests that you are completely out of the block and quite far away. Now we've made sure that none of our blocks are too long, um, such that you will trigger this spuriously. So this will only trigger when you are genuinely in a block that you shouldn't be and you're too far away. You should have exited it, something's gone wrong, and so here it just forces that exit, it forces you out of that block. So that makes sure that signals don't stay at red when they shouldn't be. Um, unfortunately, as I say, we've not quite solved the problem of signals always going to red when they should be if you skipped over the entrance block, um, but we'll have a look at that. And that's pretty much it in terms of the programming. Obviously, there's, there's all these other events. Um, it, it needs to communicate with different scripts, both on the server and in the client. Um, we actually set up the signals and set all kind of data about them in terms of their state, their mode, who's in the block, whether they're controllable, all that sort of stuff. It's, it's almost like object-oriented programming. They're, they're sort of like entities, but we don't perform methods directly on the signal. Um, so it's just shy of what I would consider to be object-oriented programming. Um, but we do store them in a table with all this kind of information about them. Um, we do also output the state, we output the mode, um, we output who's actually in the block as well, and that's just so that our manual signaling, once we've updated it, can actually pick up on those values and show them appropriately to the signaler on a nice GUI. Um, so that's all that the majority of this does, it's just setting up all of those outputs, setting up that data, um, and initializing those signals. Now we do have, I believe, over 900 signals across the whole game. So a lot of people, when they start out, will think that you want to put a script in every single signal. Now you might have gathered by this point that it's a very much a centralized system on SCR and that all of the signals are handled in that one kind of big table or as, as individual entities in there. Um, that's absolutely imperative, both for the communication of understanding um, what the signals ahead and behind are doing without having to wait for value objects to update. But also it's, it's just so, so much easier. Um, you can control exactly how things run in terms of the Lua Tash scheduler and in terms of making sure that things uh, yield appropriately, don't take up too much time, don't delay frames. We talked about a bit of that in the last episode with streaming. That applies to the signals too. Um, so I make sure that we process these in such a way that we don't delay the frames too much on the server this time um, because the server also needs to stay nice and up to date, ideally running as close to 60 frames a second as possible 
um, and that's kind of performed by making sure we don't hog too much time. So that's pretty much it in terms of the signaling system. I don't think there's much more to show you. I think if you wanted to create a signaling system for your own game, that would probably be enough information to in inspire you and get you started. Uh, you might have identified some areas that you could improve on your own system. Um, and again, kind of like with the streaming system, we, we did have to worry very much about backwards compatibility. Um, and there's always the benefit of making things completely fresh from a, from a blank slate um, if you're working on a new game. So I'd be really interested to see uh, other people's signaling systems, to see what you've done, the problems that you had to overcome for your specific game. Um, obviously we have manual signaling, which adds quite a few layers of complexity on top of just the automatic signaling. But yeah, there you go. That's that. Now, as, as last time, I'll give you a quick sneak peek about what the next episode is going to be about, if that's something that you're going to be interested in. Um, and the next episode is going to be about um, sort of to do with our API, um, the external data we do, and specifically looking at the training queue and the training assignments. So these kind of API members down here. Um, now, this is entirely created by me for SCR as a, a custom solution. Um, but you might be interested to know kind of how the queue works, how the assignment works, how they send you messages through Discord, um, and how all of that kind of ties together with the game, um, as well as requirements, and how we're going to kind of tweak that as we go into training 2.0, which will be coming in the future. So I think a lot of people are very interested about that, interested to learn about the flaws with the re reservation system that we had before. So I'll go through that, I'll explain what the problems with the reservation system are in case you were thinking of doing a similar system, highlight some of the problems that you'll need to overcome, um, and why eventually we just didn't want to go with the reservation system anymore, and have selected this queue with the, the preferences that you've seen in the game. So that's coming soon in episode 3, but that's it for episode 2, looking at the signaling system, and I'll see you next time. <laughs>